Before beginning that, I want to share something with you that I thought was very extraordinary. In the year of uh, 1956, the summer of 1956, I was what? 21 years of age. <clears throat> By request, I traveled to Montgomery, Alabama to a Bible college, Montgomery School of the Bible, to have a debate with a man named Carol Puckett. Hundreds of students attended this debate. I mean, more people went to that school than lived in the town in which I, pre <laughs> I preached. And it was, uh, it was a pretty hot debate, I'll tell you. But yet we were close friends, this Brother Carol Puckett. In fact, I stayed in his house during the debate. Today, About 10 o'clock in the morning, I got a call. Now, our phones have been out of order, but they, they worked two times. One was when Brother Kurt Fluharty called us and said we could have the next renewal at Diamond Grove. The next one was this call here. He says, is this Brother Given Blakely? I says, yes, it is. He said, I'm Carol Puckett. Told me he was concerned about me and wanted to call and check up on me. And he's the president of a Puckett and Puckett law firm. <laughs> for all things. We talked for quite a while. He said, I've read all your writings and kept track of you all these years. He just wanted you to know that we think a lot of you. He said in his words, he said, you're a great writer. Boy, this was a fierce debate. If you'd have been there, you'd have, <laughs> this is standing out to a miracle. But now, God has been doing this to me the last, I don't know if I'm coming to the end of my journey or what, but there's a lot of these acquaintances that are surfacing that I haven't heard from for well over half a century. I mean, a, a lot of them. I'm not talking about one or two. And I just wanted to share that with you, that everything was rec reconciled between me and Carol before I left. But see, that solidified that there wasn't any hostility or anything like that. Although we did, we did. <laughs> now, when you debate, you know, you you do it with swords. So I was, I just wanted to share that with you. Now, we're in Ephesians first chapter, and this is a very, very uh, weighty text. This whole first chapter. Very, very foundational, and uh, I want to be careful as we plot through it that I don't inadvertently obscure something. Some of the things, it'll, it'll sound like I'm repeating, but I'm really not. In fact, it sounds like Paul's repeating, but he's not. <clears throat> We're going to deal with obtaining an inheritance. Now, in delineating, delineating means to open, open the thing up. Salvation, Paul does not talk about what you should do. Although there are some things you should do. But when he opens up salvation, that's not what he talks about. But see, I come from a background where you had to, be, you had to major on what people were to do. And people say that's not true. They just lied. It is too true. I've been in the heart of things. You had to, in every sermon, had to make sure you outlined what they call the plan of salvation. And I got caught up in it myself. But you'll notice, I tell you, it takes a long time to get over misconceptions. And all of a sudden you realize God doesn't even talk about the stuff most people talk about all the time. 
This is not his stress at all. Now, Paul's writing to the church. He wants the church to comprehend what salvation is. So he's going to talk about what God in Christ did. That's what he's going to talk about. He's introduced us to the dispensing of grace and peace. Right off the bat, right off the bat, he talks about grace and peace being dispensed to the people. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he quickly tells us, look, he's given us everything. He's put all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All of them are there for us. Now remember, he's opening up salvation. Because if you want people to live godly, if that's really what you want... You've got to tell them what God has provided for them. Amen. It's got to be told. It's not enough to give the commandments to them. That's not enough. Or to try and straighten out their difficulties. That's not enough. If you want them to be rooted and grounded, they've got to be told what God has done. So that's what he's done. He's faithfully informed them that what God has blessed them with with spiritual expertise. He's told him God chose him before the foundation of the world. Now, people don't like to hear this. Who cares? Now, I'm old enough, I don't care, and I don't care if I tell people about it either. If they say, we don't think you should talk like that, I don't even pay any attention to them. People have got to be told God chose you before you existed. And before the world is formed. You say, well, that doesn't mean I'm interested in what it does mean, not what it doesn't mean. Amen. And it means God chose you in Christ before the foundations of the world. He told them that right out. Didn't modify it. Didn't explain it. Didn't try and fit it in with some other teaching. Just told it right out what it was. Yeah. Then he told us that God's aim is that we be holy and unblameable before him in love. He tells you right up front. Here's where God's headed. Holy, without blame, before him in love. And anything less than that is not right. Does that make any difference what it is? That's where God's headed. See, so that tells you right off the bat, God's got to be involved in this because this, this already is beyond human capability. <laughs> Holy and without blame. Not a little bit of blame, no blame. Then he tells you that as if that wasn't enough, he said, oh, look, God predestinated you to be adopted. So I don't like the word predestinate. Get used to it. It's in the Bible. Amen. God predestinated us to be adopted. That means you weren't really in the family, but he brought you into his family. But by nature, you weren't part of it. And he did this according to the good pleasure of his will. He didn't, like, consult with anybody. It wasn't he looked down in the future and said, ah, oh, this is what they're going to do. It's this is what it wasn't that at all. It was his own purpose before the foundation of the world. He did it according to the good pleasure of his will. Then he tells you, look, he, through Christ, we have redemption. <clears throat> you don't owe anybody anything but your life. Now, you owe God your life. You don't owe him any payment for what you've done. That's been paid. Amen. Either Catholics teach you do. You you could you could enter in, you could pay part of it. I think I personally participated in some of these events where they where they sell indulgences. You can buy, you buy a mass. This is I'm talking today, I'm not talking back in Luther's day. You can buy a mass and their blessings will be conferred upon the dead. We've received redemption. The price has been paid. Completely paid. Otherwise, God couldn't have the gracious dealings with you. Even the forgiveness of sins, the past been wiped out, doesn't make any difference how bad it was. Although the scriptures don't major on many people that had a bad moral past. Search and see. Well, Manasseh, that's about the worst case, Manasseh. So God uh, God showed him, to just, just to tell you what God can do, we're talking about 50, 52 years, wasn't it? 52 years, the worst reign any king ever had. He offered burned children to false God. There was hardly anything he didn't do. But at the tail end of his life, he turned to God, and God received him and restored him. 
But there's not many cases like that in the Bible. You check. If you know the Bible, you know this is the case. There's not many like that. Just in case people would assume or presume upon God. Then he tells us that God is abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. That is, God's going out of his way. To, I speak as a man now. God's going out of his way to bless you. He's doing it in such a way as does not modify his character, doesn't impinge upon his purpose. He's in wisdom and prudence. He's working so you are going to end up thinking about him. Now, that's quite a, quite a task. At the wisdom and prudence, you're going, to, you're going to end up looking toward him, wanting what he has to offer. And he made known, now all this is what God's done. So he's made known unto us the mystery of his will. He didn't reveal it. Nobody could stumble on it. Nobody could study nature and arrive at it. Nobody could read the law and figure out what God's going to do. Nobody could read the prophets and conclude what God was going to do. God just kept a secret for the foundation of the world. After Jesus was enthroned in glory, then he leaked out the information. And until that time, nobody knew. Well, they had little ideas here and there, but nobody really knew what God was going to do. They completely misinterpreted Jesus when he came. The people had the book. People had the prophets. People had the prophets. They completely misinterpreted Jesus when he came. Even though, even though now you look back at it, it's real plain to you. Now that you're on the inside, <laughs> it's real plain. It wasn't. So wisdom and prudence, see, to work with those kind of people, you've got to be wise and prudent, and he was. Made known according, according to his will, he made his, it known. The appointed outcome of the marvelous work he's doing, he's going to gather together into one all things in heaven, all things in earth. That's where God's, that's where this is headed. Yeah. It's all headed, all things in heaven, all things in one amalgamated into one harmonious whole. No firmament, so to speak, between them. That's where God's headed. That's why division is so wrong. That's why it's so wrong. It's counterproductive to what God's doing. All right, and that's what he's told us so far. It's all, all what God has done. Now he's, Christ is the topic he's settled on right now. Gathered together to one all things in, in Christ. See, so that's now Christ is the subject. This is our text, verse 11 and 12. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory. And that reads pretty much the same in every translation. It's a strange story. To the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. <coughs> Who have a, in whom, in Christ, mm -hmm. we have obtained an inheritance. Now the spotlight shining on Jesus. That's where the spotlight's shining. Mm -hmm. He's the one in whom all the following thoughts are considered. Paul has said he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He confirmed that grace and peace come from the Lord Jesus Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. God chose us in Christ. God accepted us in the beloved, in Christ. We've obtained redemption through his blood. We have forgiveness of sins through Jesus. And God's purpose is to gather everything together into one in Christ. See the spotlights on Christ. That's where it's all going to happen is in Christ. Now, the more obscure Christ is, the less this is, the least apt this is to happen. You see why it's so wrong to have a religion that minimizes Christ. I don't think anybody in, intentionally minimizes Christ. I mean, when I minimized him, I didn't intentionally do it. It was, it was my own stupidity. I had accepted another view of things. The main thing was to fix the human problem. That was the main thing, the main thing. 
That's not the main thing. The main thing is for God's will to be done. That's the main thing. If it isn't done, it doesn't Amen. make any difference how you, much you help people. It doesn't make any difference. Amen. And every bit, every show of mercy that's shown among humanity, such as we've had in our town, is a means to an end. It's not the end. Amen. Amen. And everybody who helps somebody else, if they know Christ, it's their business to tell these people we're doing this in the name of Christ. We we are concerned for you because we love God, and this is how God. I mean, to make clear that God has moved this type type of activity to take place. All in Christ. When we begin to speak about salvation, <coughs> uh, and everything is included in it. Jesus Christ must be the prominent part of the speaking. Got to be. <coughs> Otherwise, it won't make sense. It'll become disjointed. Now, it says, in whom, that's a whom is Christ, in whom. He's the required environment. We get to talk about the inheritance. The inheritance is something God gives. See? So when we get to talking about it, the environment is him, in whom. That's the environment. person isn't in Christ, no inheritance. I don't know if we need sense to talk about it. This, this is family talk. We're, this is family talk we're engaging in now. This isn't what we tell the world. This doesn't mean anything to the world. You tell the world inheritance, they're not going to be thinking there. They're going to be thinking here. So this isn't even for the world. For the world is, look, God, this is the message for the world. If you want to know what to tell the world, God made you. God placed you in time and place so you would seek him. And God's appointed day, he's going to judge you by Jesus Christ. Period. Now, if they inquire further in it, we got a piece of good news. If they don't, then we start reasoning a little bit more about righteousness. God says you've got to be righteous. You've got to be righteous. It's not an option. Temperance, you've got to control yourself. You can, you've got to do it. You can't have a habit that overtakes you. This is reasoning about temperance. And judgment to come. That still doesn't wake him up. Just move on to the next person. That's 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 what that's the message we got for the world. And don't think the world doesn't listen. At Pentecost, they listened. You through the hands of the Lord, boy, I tell you, it woke them up right now. Why? Because that's the message God works with. When you're talking to God's people, now you got to talk about a lot about Christ in whom. In whom. Think of the things that are said to be in Christ. Acts 24, 24 speaks about faith in Christ. Redemptions in Christ. Romans 3, 24. Romans 3, 25. Believing in Christ. Romans 8, 1. The saved themselves are in Christ. The law of the spirit of life is in Christ. There's the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's one body in Christ. The approval of God is in Christ. Sanctification is in Christ. Hope is in Christ. Establishment is in Christ. Triumph is in Christ. Speaking the truth is in Christ. The doing away of the veil of obscurity is lifted away, taken away in Christ. We're new creatures in Christ. The doing away, the doing away of obscurity is in Christ. Liberty is in Christ. The confirmation of the covenant is in Christ. The oneness of believers is in Christ. Faithfulness is in Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Being made nigh is in Christ. There's also God's promises that are in Christ. His eternal purpose is in Christ. The truth is in Christ. Rejoicing is in Christ. <clears throat> the proper mindset is in Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. The prize of the high calling is in Christ. <clears throat> Ultimate perfection presents you perfect in Christ. 
The will of God is in Christ. This is the will of God in Christ because when you're in Christ. Faith and love is in Christ. The promise of life is in Christ. God's purpose and grace is in Christ. Grace is in Christ. Salvation is in Christ. Living godly is in Christ. Boldness is in Christ. A good manner of life is in Christ. Preservation is in Christ. It's a name of you. The name of you. You think to yourself, how could anybody miss this? Yes. I think of John chapter 5 when he, he says that uh, he has committed all judgment to the Son yeah. that all men would honor the Son mm -hmm. as, yeah. as they honor the Father. Yeah. And then in John 17, Jesus says to the Father to glorify Him that He may glorify the Father. That's right. So, see, there's more more light emanating from Jesus than anybody else that sheds upon the person. That's of God. right. Amen. And so God has structured salvation in such a way. He's given all, everything He has to give to men. He's put it in Christ so that men honor and seek Christ because when they look to Christ, now they're able to behold the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. And God is ultimately glorified. Amen. By mm -hmm. Amen. See, it's all. It's all. <laughs> but see, here's the catch. You can't build a career on this. You can't build a business on this. You can't build an institution on this. You can't even build a ministry on this. This all accrues to God's glory. And you'll notice the closer you get to God, the less you are in accruing glory for yourself. I hardly see how God could have made it any plainer that Christ is at the heart of things. I, I don't see how it would be possible for it to be made any more plain. And yet, it is greatly obscured to many people. I, I was one who was obscured to myself. Greatly obscured, even though I was not a sloppy living person. I was, a, I was an avid student of the Scripture. I did want to please God. I wasn't playing any games with this. I forfeited all earthly advantages. But yet I, I didn't see this because I had inadvertently bought into a skewed theology. And so I know sometimes people think I talk too much about this, but I personally am very convicted I don't talk enough about it. Because I know a lot of other people are in the same boat I was in. They, they are, it's Christ is number two. I don't care what they say, it's number two. Someone finally had the nerve to speak up and tell me that. I had the church was number one. That was that's what I thought. And, it, and well, I didn't say that. I didn't say it was, but that's what I was giving myself to, notwithstanding. All right, now yes. To Christ, then you will be giving yourself to the church in the way that Christ. That's right. Christ yeah. See, I'm. I can see more and more that I don't think people know what that means to give themselves to Christ. I don't think, I'm just sharing my own thoughts there. I don't think people know what it means to believe on Christ or to trust in Christ or to know God. I think these are all ambiguous terms and that very few people have a sound concept of what they are. Because they're taken for granted. They're, they're church talk, jargon. Loving God, believing, you know, this sort of thing. But they're not just that kind of talk in Scripture. When God tells you to believe on His Son, He talks about His Son. That's what He talks about. It's the record He's given of His Son. 1 John 5, 5.10 Now to these people who are in Christ... He says, now we, body, body we, yeah. all the redeemed, that's the we. We have obtained an inheritance. Now, in Christ, there's a unique perspective that isn't found anyplace else. What we are said to have obtained, we only have a part of it. See, it's not like that... <laughs> If you obtain a house, you're not just given one room. But this is the way it is in the kingdom. We've obtained an inheritance, but who among us would say we got the whole thing? We just got a little 
So a bunch of grapes, that's what we got. It's very real. It's a pledge of the inheritance. It's the same thing as we've obtained mercy. But did we obtain all of mercy? No, we just got like a sampling of mercy. We've obtained salvation. 1 John 5, 9, 2 Timothy 2, 10. But, not, but the greater part of it is still to come. See, now this is a kingdom mentality that people have to get hold of. Otherwise, your conscience will beat you down. You'll say, I don't have very much, so I must not be in. No. If you got anything at all, you're in. Amen. If you, all you got is a bunch of grapes of Mexico, you've been in the promised land. Yeah. You don't have the vine yet, see, but you, just, you have... You have obtained. Yeah. This is one view. There's another view of it, too. Yes? It, it is the, what we need to mortify the flesh. That's good. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Amen. That's Amen. exactly it's, right. It is sufficient for the time. Yes. Amen. You could never do that just on the basis of a commandment, even though God commands, <laughs> commands us to do it. Yeah. You, do, you need these first fruits. That's right. It, it fortifies our hope. That's good. Mm -hmm. Amen. So that we will forsake these other things in, in Amen. order to obtain. Mm -hmm. now, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you ahead of time. <laughs> the fact that you got anything at all is because God chose you. Amen. And the fact that he chose you yes. is what puts your name on the inheritance. Uh -huh. that, that's the thing that, that we're, we're going to explore a little bit here tonight. So you're said to obtain it, even though from the experiential viewpoint, you haven't obtained it all, but what you've you've entered in, mm -hmm. you've entered in, but you're just on the border, so to speak. When Israel entered into Canaan, they were in, they were in it, but they're just <laughs> just on the edge. But they were in it; they'd obtained it. The NIV version just commit uh, omits this entire phrase. Other versions read, "We were made a heritage," and there's some truth there. That we ourselves are the inheritance that, that God gets. Salvation is what you get. You're what God gets. <laughs> I think of it that way. And we personally, when you're, when you're on the inside, we want God to have something that's worthy of his name. So what, but we also know that we, don't, we could not measure up at all. So he said, but I've given you all things that pertain to the life of Godliness, all spiritual blessings, everything you need to maintain this position is yours. See, in that sense, you've obtained. In other words, you can have as much of this inheritance as you're able to, uh, to contain. Well, if God were to dump the whole thing on you now, it would kill us. We could... We couldn't have... We're not made of this, these bodies. We can't do it. But you can have as much of this as you can hold. As far as I know, there's no limit. God, he put a limit on Israel. He said, you can come up to the mount, but you can't touch it. Remember, he put a fence around it. They were limited, but there's no limits like that in Christ. Yes? The more we're continued to be filled with these things, filled to the capacity, the more it enlarges That's right. our capacity to, That's gain, right. to gain more. That's another thing that God, God does. God can enlarge your heart <laughs> and enlarge your capacity see you're not you're not born with a fixed capacity born again I mean with a fixed capacity it can enlarge so at any when it says be filled with the spirit it has this <laughs> be filled that this idea is that you're growing and expanding and if there's 15 cubic feet in your soul is full of the Spirit, and if there's 50 cubic feet it's full of the Spirit, see? Yeah. It's adapted to living by faith. Amen. But he's got to tell you, you've got, you've obtained now. Yeah. It's also, uh, as, it, as you get filled up, it pushes other things out. That's right. Amen. Amen. Now, when you receive the Word of God in truth, <coughs> There's a process that starts, you're put into the receiving mode. <laughs> See, you've got, uh, I've got, some, on my system, I've got some earphones and a mouthpiece. So I can listen, I can talk. 
But in the kingdom of God, the earphones are the most important. <laughs> You're the most important. Yeah. Amen. God makes you a receiver. The new creation is, is a, has an extraordinary capacity to receive. From God, we're talking about. To receive from God. And as it matures, it's able to receive more. And uh, I, who knows? You can take a sudden, sudden leap in the spirit almost overnight when something like opens up, some new vista opens, and suddenly you can contain. All of a sudden, all these scriptures come, begin coming into your mind, falling into place, and you just, suddenly you're holding more than you ever could hold before. So we're <coughs> you've obtained the inheritance, being predestinated. Now he he's very careful. He won't he won't let flesh of glory. You know he won't let flesh of glory. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated. It's not your choice that did it. It's God's choice that did it, according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. What does that mean? It means when he gives you more, it's because he wants to do it. Now, does that sound better, or I get more because I want it? Which now you do get more because you want it, but what, but the idea that God wants to give it, now that that puts a whole new light on it. So, when speaking of the sureness of obtaining the inheritance, he's got to bring God into the picture, because there is no surety in the flesh or in this world, unless unless God or Christ, something from heaven, interjects with mankind, intersects with mankind, surety is not possible. But at the point, <laughs> oh, praise God, at the point God comes into the picture, surety begins to mature. Sure, confidence, assurance, these sort of phrases. There's a value in calling upon the name of the Lord. But the predest being predestinated is what is the engine that brought pushed that in. There's a value in coming to me. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden. But by what he's telling you is the value has been determined by what God did. You did what you, we love him because, because he first loved us. I mean, it's in the doctrine. It's, we, we don't have to adopt like a cold, lifeless doctrine. Some people do. They talk about God's predestination just like an ice cube, like a theological ice cube. But when you throw God wants, <laughs> God desires, God delights, now this this is another matter. Being predestinated according to his purpose. So forever blot from your mind the idea that God God's predestination was based on what men call prescience. That is, he looked down, he saw what men were going to do, and he chose because of what men are going to do, no? See, Paul cast that down. It's an imagination now to be cast down. It's predestinated. Having been predestinated, the predestination preceded your response. Amen. Yeah. That's what he's saying. This is what he's, he's right. building. He's teaching the saints to reason backwards. Uh -huh. yeah. He's saying, look what you got, and here's why you got it. Yeah. And God doesn't abandon his work unless his work turns his back on him. Yeah. See? He completes the work. Being predestinated. And some of the other versions say having been predestined or having been destined, having been foreordained, being marked out from the first, who were picked in advance, also decided ahead of time to choose us. For we had been beforehand chosen and appointed beforehand, foreordained or chosen and appointed beforehand. See, the translators, they couldn't get away from what this said. They just had to... I'm sure some of their theology was hammered when they said this, but they, this is what the text says. And that's where you got to start. you got to start with what God said. So do you mean he actually picked them out? Yes, that's exactly what he means. 
Who would you rather pick them out? Amen. If someone's going to do the picking, who do you want it to be? Everything that we have done, as you said, is a response, which means yeah. everything we've done in the work of salvation has been a product of Him working in us. Amen. That's right. How can God be glorified in all things if you've done something independent of Him working yeah. in you? Uh -huh. How can He be glorified in all things? Even your coming to Christ was a result That's right. of being taught by God. Or That's you would right. never, ever have come to Christ. That's right. Now it says that, I think in 2 Timothy 2.19, the, the foundation of the Lord stands yeah. sure. The Lord knows them that are His. Uh -huh. But now the real work is for us to know who it is, who, if we're one. That, that's, the work, that's the assignment given by to Christ and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Teach the people uh -huh. who they are. Yeah. Teach the people why they are who they are. Yes. Trace it back to me, uh -huh. then finally it bursts. Finally it breaks through your understanding and you see it. What do you do? You thank God. Amen. That's, that's what I was looking for, God says. That's what, exactly what I was looking for. The accuser of the brethren doesn't accuse people with what God does. He accuses them with what they do. That's right. And so, woe is me if I've convinced myself that salvation is founded on my choice. Because mm -hmm. then that, gives, yeah. that just gives more fodder to the wicked one. Amen. Yeah. See the mistake people make is they think that we're saying that man doesn't choose. No, we're not. No, we're not saying that at all. We're accounting for why man chooses. Why did Saul of Tarsus say, what do you want me to do? Why did he say that? It's because of what? <laughs> it's because the Son of God had apprehended him. That's why he said it. That's why you said it too. That's what he's getting at. To the, if the Ephesians are going to assess their self the, properly, he had already told them, I heard of your faith and love, your faith in Christ, your love toward all saints. You've got these traits. Now I'm going to tell you why you have them. Yes. And so your faith and hope will be in God and not in your personal attainments. So you won't think highly of yourself because you have faith and because you love, and you won't think more highly of yourself and say, look, I see how I've advanced more than the other people. I have, oh, the only reason you have faith and love is because of God's choice. Mm -hmm. It would never have happened otherwise. God even made it clear that even there's no way that we can even think believing is any kind of work. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because he's, you know, he makes it clear that he's given to believe. Amen. Yeah. And that's a, that's a ground level work. That's a very basic work from which all a lot of other things spring. That's right. So you can, if you believe, you can thank God you believe. Yeah. Give him praise as you believe. Mm -hmm. I once had, I was a young man, someone asked this question. We were at a crusade, and some people responded, and some people didn't. And the person said, Oh, why did they all heard the same thing? Some were sitting in the same place. Mm -hmm. Why did some believe and some not believe? Well, at that, by that time, I had picked up on these things. I said, Well, to, it was given to some to believe, and it wasn't given to others. Yeah. Does that mean they're going to hell? Oh no, there's a, as long as they're alive, it could be <laughs> it could be given to them too. See? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, what <coughs> having predestinated us according to the purpose of him. In other words, God just didn't at random pick and choose. It wasn't that he had an objective. His aim is now they're going to be with me. I want to counsel with my own will. What do I want? As I always say, counsel with your own will. What do I really want? See, now, if you counsel with your will, you'll find how weak your will is. You'll, you'll not be able to do most of what you really want to do. You just, it's just kind of a wish list is all it is. But God's not this way. What do I want to do? Hmm. Got to think big now because we're thinking about my mercy. We're thinking about my grace. I'm going to... I, my desire is to gather everything together into one in Christ, in heaven and on earth. So what I'm, I'm going to have to make the I'm going to have to make the people on earth have the same kind of nature the folk in heaven have them. I'm going to have to put an appetite. Now this is where the wisdom and prudence comes in. <laughs> See, he actually does that, but he does it in wisdom and in prudence. So maybe for some of you. 
Maybe it dawned on you after a couple of years, maybe for somebody 50 years before. But wisdom and prudence. And here's something else I'll tell you. If it took you a long time to get in, God has readied you to bear some witness to other people so it won't take so long for them to get in. Amen. That's how it works in the kingdom. That's how it works. They're specialists in every, in short-term conversions, they're specialists. In long-term ones, they're specialists. They're specialists who've walked this way. According to the purpose of him. See, now remember, he's gowned in the confidence of the people. He works all things after the counsel of his will. Oh, of course, this phrase is used several times in Scripture. God does not work according to what he sees. He works according to what he wills. <laughs> That's a big difference. There's a big difference. God worked, now, God worked according to what he saw at the flood. He saw. That's what he did. But in, in his grand purpose, the eternal purpose, he works according to what he wants, what he desires. Spirit plainly, in other words, the spirit plainly is saying salvation is God's work. That's just boiled down to its essence. That's what he's saying. Salvation is God's work. Amen. And salvation is fulfilling what God wants. And what God wants is perfectly compatible with God's character. Because mm -hmm. yes. God can't want anything that's contrary to his person. So salvation allows for him to fulfill desires that he just he couldn't fulfill otherwise. There was no way to do it. If you want to display your mercy, you're going to have to have somebody that needs mercy. You're going to have to have some unworthy. You're going to have to show mercy on unworthy people if you want to magnify your mercy. You know, that's why we, he started the way he did. So if he, he proved that man doesn't have an inherent worth. He's worth less of himself. The only time man has worthiness is when he's swallowed up in God's purpose. Ah, now, if you can get into God's purpose, now you've got value. Amen. Kingdom value, precious. Even your death is precious in his sight. Yes. Um, in here, when you said um, that salvation is God's work, it can't. Man cannot work salvation himself. God has to do it. That's right. That's right, Mr. Bailey. I think that <laughs> I'm glad that uh, we're not locked into this sort of thing. But I think that salvation has been understated. If people talk about being saved and it's just this too, it's understated. It's, salvation is a great, well, there's never been a work like it. Yeah. It's the greatest work of the ages. Salvation is. It transcends the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. It's greater than that. It's greater than Noah being saved from the flood. It's greater than that. It's greater than David killing Goliath or the Israelites defeating the Midianites. You're putting things in the context of God's will. Whenever you think about salvation, really, the only point of humanity, or mm -hmm. of the earth, or of time, or anything that we're familiar with, is salvation. If God had not purposed salvation, probably wouldn't have been a creation. As we That's know. right. Uh -huh. yeah. That's so, right. Amen. I mean, everything else is just is a, a prop and, mm -hmm. and product yeah. of this eternal purpose of God. Mm -hmm. You'll, you'll notice that if you if you were to say, why did God make man? You can find some statements in Scripture, but they tend to be kind of vague. Mm -hmm. And there's not it doesn't come right out and make a crystal clear statement, this is why I made you. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it is in the doctrine. Uh -huh. He made man for the to fulfill his purpose. Yeah, right. That he has a finally bringing a unity between everything on earth and everything in the heaven. And that's why he made man. But see, it's, it's not stated in a, in a statement. Mm -hmm. It's stated in a, in a doctrine and in a perspective. And once you see it, well, you, like the song says, I can't feel at home in the world anymore. Because yeah, he's targeting something after the world passes away. 
given salvation is unique in that it can reach back in time <laughs> and also forward. Forward in time, that's right. Now here's... He worked all things after the counsel of his will, predestined us according to this, so that we should be to the praise of his glory. Now that is a most intriguing phrase. And almost all the versions say to the praise of his glory. There are a few variations. In order that we might be, we might be to the praise of his glory, in order that we might live to the praise of his glory, that we might, to the end that we should like be, be praising God but that's not what it says the praise of his glory not praise and glory praise of his glory now we've mentioned before what glory is glory is what's made known of God glory is to God what the rays are to the sun it's the manifest it's what God has made known of himself to the praise of his glory means that that manifestation is what's, what's praised. Because people see that manifestation. They see what God has done and they praise because they see what God has done. That's the praise of his glory. All right, now what this text is saying is not that we should praise God for what God's done for us. All so Some versions do read that way. We are the praise. We are the trophies. We are the yeah. exhibits Amen. of what God can do. Yes. Oh, that the world saw it. Mm -hmm. See, a, the church saw it. Yeah. That's right. A church that is divided and in the shape it's in today cannot bring glory to God. Amen. But you take someone who has seen some of the things we talked about here tonight and they've acted upon them, God shows what he can do with a person mm -hmm. that trusts in him. Amen. And what, what works it? His great power, his grace, his grace works it. He's showing what grace can do. Grace isn't overlooking things. Grace isn't like pretending a person's good when he's not. Grace isn't tolerating people to remain in a, in a terrible state. That's not what grace is. Grace is a working agent. Grace, I am what I am by the grace of God. And you yourself become an exhibit of what God Almighty can do by his grace. And then praise starts going up like incense from heaven. And until that happens, this praise is just a kind of a, for, kind of a dead formality. Of what we were in. That's you right. Know, you can't come out with that. See, if there's no difference, if a person is not changed, God can't be glorified. The change is what glorifies God. We know what we were. We, if people want us to elaborate, we could, we could tell them why is God, he didn't have a lot to start with when he started with us. What we are, we are the workmen, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus on the good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. We are the, that's his glory, what God can do is manifested in the people in whom he works. Mm -hmm. The Lord did gain glory in the armies of Egypt when they were swallowed in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And there are other examples of negative things. We yeah. might say that he gained glory by, by demonstrating his superior power, yeah. wisdom, and so forth. But this is greater. This than is that. grace here. See, this is different. That's right. Yeah, God can make his wrath known, remember? Yes, yes. He endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath suited for destruction. And he's going to make his wrath known. And he'll, there's glory goes to. But he's talking about this glory as the glory of his grace because that's the thing that man has not been able to understand in the past. And he still has a considerable difficulty understanding the potency of God's grace. Mm -hmm. It's transforming in its effects. Yes. It enlarges the people. 
It equips the people. We receive gifts by the, and we're stewards of the grace of God. Yes. See, the grace is what gives us these abilities. Amen. No, but as you're talking about that, whenever you're talking about praise, I and God's glory very rarely have I heard anybody rejoicing over the glories of God's wrath or you know yeah. the, or his, his power to destroy and to take away and remove and, and cast down I mean there were pretty people that praised him for the deliverance that they received because mm -hmm. he did that on their behalf but it wasn't just because he had power to destroy and and to to decimate, but when you talk about the the glory of his of his grace, you're talking about a very comely <coughs> aspect of God that cannot be seen except under certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Just like his wrath is not seen unless provoked, <coughs> his grace is not seen unless provoked. There's a reason to exhibit it. And that there's a, an arena in which it works that be, can be perceived. And when we praise the Lord, what God recognizes mm -hmm. as praise, we have seen something and we were, by some means, we're opening it up. Now, this may be a crude example. None of us in this room have ever met Michelangelo, ever. Couldn't tell you whether he brushed his teeth or whether he liked people or anything about it. But we have his works mm -hmm. that we see. And so people have a high regard for him, and they'll extol him for his, his abilities in, in art. How do we know that? Because we see his works. Yeah. We've never met him. It's like knowing someone through their works, in a certain aspect of them. That's right. Well, God is being known through his works and they see it in us. That's right. It's we're, different we're, than just having a pronouncement from heaven or him being in heaven and having these qualities. It's actually working in us in a way that not only other men, but principalities and powers, and powers and dominions. Mm -hmm. And within this context, he's doing... See, it's not just about man. He's <coughs> destroying or has destroyed the works of the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whenever he was cast out of heaven, he was defeated, but his works weren't destroyed. Yeah. There's a far-reaching thing that reaches up into heaven as well down into earth. Everything is being affected by salvation. Things we don't even know exist are being affected <clears throat> by salvation. Amen. This is, mm -hmm. this is a work beyond our comprehension. Yeah. We just see the part we're involved in and the part that God has been pleased to reveal to us. And that's enough to comprehend as you're going over. That's, it's, it's pretty big for man to, to be able to, well, amen. to get hold of mm -hmm. even after God told us. Mm -hmm. And he's working it right in our midst. Mm -hmm. We still have trouble really seeing it for what it is. You remember there in 2 Corinthians 3 mm -hmm. when Paul said, Ye are the epistles of Christ. Mm -hmm. The epistles of Christ matches praise of his glory. Uh -huh. See, what, who, the ones called epistles there are called praise in our text. Uh -huh. They're the exhibit of what grace does in a person. Amen. Now, when, now, here's another aspect of this, that when Paul urged people to be holy, and Peter urged him, be holy, as I always, when he urged them, it wasn't just so they would be holy. It was because that was the means through which God would get glory. Yeah, uh -huh. see, it's a higher purpose than right. just that we should be holy. Right. We should be holy, uh -huh. but see, it's more, more it's involved in that. This holiness that's in you, legitimately in you, manifests the working of God. Yes. And it's the kind of work nobody knew about yes. until redemption. Yes. It, it should give us a heads up whenever, <coughs> right from the very beginning, God made us in His image. image. That's right. Mm -hmm. What That's do right. you need an image for? That's right. To be seen. That's right. 
The things that are invisible are reflected in us in a That's visible right. manner. Mm -hmm. See, God can't be seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. His person, but His glory can be seen in His work. Amen. That's right. See, so no man has seen Him at any time, mm -hmm. but a lot of people have seen what He did. Yes, He's immortal and invisible. That's right. And in His salvation, yeah. He's worked a work that men can see more. Yeah. Of God uh -huh. that they'd ever seen before or could possibly see yes. before. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen them. That's right. <laughs> Brother Gimmick? Yes. Um, I was considering the example of um, we can't see the wind, but we can see the effect of yeah, it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same we can thing. See how it works. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That we might be, that we might be yeah. to the praise of his glory. <laughs> then he had this last. Sinners who first trusted in Christ. All right, there's a number of different ways people view this. Some say, "Well, we were the first. We Jews were the first ones to trust in Christ." Well, and that there's a sense in which that's true. Some say it's like a reference to Paul. Well, we first trusted in Christ. But here's how if you choose to see it: that this whole process of be, being made to the praise of His glory commences with. Trusted in Christ. That's the first. That's the first matter, because God works through this faith or trust. Trust is another word for hope. You know, in the old scriptures, they use the word trust a lot, where faith is used a lot in the new covenant scriptures. But trust has the idea of relying, depending upon, depending upon him. When you depend upon Christ and you lean upon him with the weight of your soul and not your own understanding, you actually do this, grace takes over. Amen. And then grace makes you an exhibit. Yes. Amen. Look, look at here what I've done. In Scripture, he'll do this. He'll say, now I want to testify to you about how I work. So wait, let me show you Abraham. Let me show you him. He might show you John the Baptist. He might show you him. Or Noah. He might show you him. But what he can do, see? What, this is what he, there are exhibits because you, otherwise you have to philosophize about it. Yeah. And then God's too, God's too high to philosophize about it. Your thoughts can't get high enough. So he brings it down. He brings himself down, mm -hmm. so to speak, in a human form. He, he, it was a perfect replica in Christ. Yes. Uh -huh. In Christ, it turned to heaven. He resumed the work <coughs> upon earth of making people the praise yes. of God's Amen. glory. And the last person that Satan wanted God to bring up was Job. Yes. <laughs> and that's the one he brought up. Yes, right. Have you considered my Have you considered? <laughs> well, I, I, I trust you. You kind of saw that where I was headed with this, but this is quite a... Quite an avenue of thought. Now it says, that he'll say later in Ephesians 1, 19, that you might know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See, the saints are his inheritance. That is sort of what we're talking about here, to the praise of his. In other words, God's going to be, proud's not the word, God's going to be magnified when he displays the, the church, the glorified church. Look at this jewel here. Look at here. Look at here what I produced. In Satan's domain, I produced it. I started out with nothing and I produced it. I took him through the fire and I took him through the water, but look what I made. Amen. All the angels are going to say, we recognize it's your work, Lord. We can, we can see. We're going to, they're a praise to your glory. <laughs> Amen. Oh, my goodness. I just, so I can barely uh, contain myself. <laughs> about the same way, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Yes. Under the right, uh, That's under right. The right pressure. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh -huh. Amen. Push us up to the earth. Mm -hmm. That's what God's doing. Now, see, that's how, this is how Paul's building the assurance of the saints. By testifying what God's doing in Christ Jesus and assuring them he's fully able to carry this project out yes. to its conclusion. Yeah. Amen. It helps us to identify the work in our 
ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. So whatever he talks a lot about, like faith and hope and consolation and this sort of thing, those are like primary areas where God's working are made known. See, these things that he stresses in Scripture, these are like primary ears. Yep. In the, in the Law and the Prophets, there were times whenever uh, intercessions were made for particular situations and yeah. for the people, and they reasoned on, on God. Just like Moses, whenever he said, if you kill them, yeah, right. they'll hear in yeah, Egypt, right. and uh -huh. they'll say, because their God could not bring them that's into right. the land. Yeah. He couldn't deliver them. Well, there, it, whenever you know this, and you, you're going through a, a particularly difficult time, and you feel the jeopardy to your own soul, you can call out and say, Lord, for your glory's sake. Oh, good. <laughs> and because of the work of your hands, and for, for your name's sake, mm -hmm. keep me. Give, give me strength and grace. That your glory not suffer. Amen. Amen. There are two. Uh, as I've been thinking about believing and what believing is and walking by faith is, there are two aspects to it that we've seen in people that walk by faith throughout scriptural history. And anybody who's had faith has been like this. And one is a deep longing to see the will of God done. Yeah, that's people right. that walk by faith were never self-absorbed people. They never got caught up in their own in their own desires and what yeah. they wanted to do. They always, whether it's Abel offering a sacrifice or Paul spinning himself for the Lord, they were all absorbed in whatever they knew was the will of God. And the other thing, they all had an acute awareness of their need for God to accomplish that. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. So this is this is remarkable to see this work in yourself as your as your uh, hunger and desire yeah. to see the will of God, you can say like Jesus, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and finish His work. And finish His work. And then you find yourself neat when you when you fit yourself in this context, like you said, uh -huh. of, of things that are utterly impossible to men that only God can yeah. do. Mm -hmm. It certainly does make for trust. Amen. Amen. Trust in God. Amen. Now this work is so um, distinct in all of eternity. In that a trophy you put up on a shelf and, and and you display it, and yet the church is the habitation of yes, God. The habitation. So he's, he's not, it's, it's not just a show, although it is. He's going to live in it. That's right. Amen. This is precious Which, to him. That's why, it has, that's why it's to the praise of his glory. Amen. See, God can't live in something that doesn't, that doesn't project his that's glory. Right. See? Amen. <laughs> yes. So he's making us a suitable habitation. Yes, Brother Aaron. Oh, I thought they saw your hand. I just thought about that too. I'm thinking about several things, but just like how even on the earth we live here, this is our habitation where, mm -hmm. well, we do things that that show glory to us. Like if you're planting a garden or making it pretty and all mm -hmm. that, the, the work we do shows the type of people we are, mm -hmm. uh, how we mm -hmm. have. So God does the same thing in us. We're going to be his habitation. And I was thinking about this inheritance too. We're we're uh, we have an inheritance, but we're Christ's inheritance. So what He's creating is really good. Yes. I mean, oh, really amen. Good, really, really good. He's not going to give His Son something that's shabby. Yes, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Now this this is a a good thing for us to all keep in mind. To if it's of our own person, just speaking of ourselves personally, ourselves. To determine within yourself to to be a good exhibit. Be a good exhibit because you already know by personal experience what a good exhibit does for you, right? Yeah. You, you already know. When you see a person who's living wholeheartedly for God, it, it does something. Yes. Well, you determine to be Amen. to be that, and you'll help the process along, speaking yeah. as a man. Yes, Brother Mike? One of the things that Paul brings out in Ephesians as far as I know, it's not brought out in this manner in, in any other book. He just expounds how that God is doing all of this very openly. Yes. We're in, in the presence of men and angels. And it's His working in the midst of the earth, mm. which means this is something that, that is very visible mm -hmm. and perceivable by by what, what He's doing. And uh, this is 
it's, it's like if you were to watch a craftsman make something very skillfully, a work of art or mm -hmm. something of wood or metal or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot more impressive to watch watch the entire work. You know yeah. what he started with, mm -hmm. yeah. and you watch him do the whole thing yeah. Yeah. and see what he ends with. That's that's the the most impressive way to do it, and that's mm -hmm. the way God's doing it. He's not doing anything in a secret. Yeah. 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 Order, yeah. It's yeah. all being done openly. Yeah. Another just kind of a side thought in addition to that, I was wondering in the judgment day how many of those who who never recognize God's work here, I wonder if on the judgment day if they'll ever ever get it. If they'll ever Yeah, I thought the same thing. Yeah. 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 If they do it'll be a torment one. Yes. It... Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the magnitude of your salvation and the way you've proclaimed it to us. We ask for grace now to help us in the time of need, help us to live in such a manner as not to detract from your glory, but to provoke praise. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>